right, I want to thank everyone for coming out to our next speaker, Josh Shields with uh, BAE Systems. He is a Gulfstream captain, so I'll turn it off, Josh. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm coming to you from the other side of the industry, and uh, you've probably sat here all morning and had the airlines beat you over the head with why you want to be a United pilot or a Delta pilot or a SkyWest pilot or a Republic pilot or a Chautauqua pilot or whomever you've talked to. Um, I will tell you right offhand that um, I was you 22 years ago or 26 years ago, depending where you are in your career at UND. Um, and I grew up in Washington, D.C. All I wanted to be was United 777 captain. United's my hometown airline. So we'll talk about how I got from being in your seat to how I got to being in the left seat of this aircraft here behind me. This is a Gulfstream G550. Um, it's the plane that I fly right now. Uh, the only plane that my company happens to own at the moment. But we'll talk a little bit about that. Any of you Calvin and Hobbes fans? Man, now I really feel old. You need to fix this. So if you've never read Calvin and Hobbes comic, it's the best comic in the world. But uh, there's some great, great aviation uh, comics out there. And you know, as a kid, I was growing up and I always thought, man, if I got to do, do some of the fun stuff that uh, Calvin got to do, that, that'd be pretty sweet. So your career, start here at UND, end up wherever. This is a Challenger 604 that I flew uh, from 2010 to 2015. And if only it was as easy as just drawing it on a map and, and going. Figured I'd start out with a little story about Grand Forks circa 1997. Uh, you all are aware of what this week is to this city. Uh, it's the 25th anniversary of the Grand Forks flood and the fire. And I am now an airline transport pilot with seven type ratings and 8,000 rough hours flying all over the world. But uh, my first opportunity com for command was as a private first class in the North Dakota Army National Guard with the 131st Quartermaster Detachment right across, let's see, I don't know which way north is, but right across the railroad tracks at the armory. And Private First Class Shields had not been to basic training yet. He had been taught how to drive a Humvee, signed off on that, and how to operate a 10,000 gallon per minute pump. And my first sergeant came to me and said, Shields, you need to go up to the Northern States propane facility. This is off of Mill Road. I took this picture yesterday. Um, they have a sand by a dike about around it. The Red River is starting to impinge on this propane tank. And if the water gets to the tank, it will vent. So me and another private, all of 18 or 19 years old, hop in this Humvee and we drive up there and we put our hip waders on and we set up our pump. And my first opportunity for command involved 36 hours straight at this facility trying to pump water across the dam or over the earthen uh, dike that they had. I fell asleep. My partner fell asleep in the Humvee. It was about 3 in the morning, and I wake up cold and wet. And I can't figure out what's going on because you come out of that deep slumber, and you're like, oh my gosh, what's happening? I was sitting this deep in water. The water, the river had come up with the Humvee. The Humvee's underwater now, and you have that moment of panic. we got to get out of here. So we grab the hoses and everything and start to drive away. During the time that we were sitting there, a log or something had hit the Humvee, disconnected the pump from the back of the Humvee, I pulled away, this $100,000 pump flips into the Red River, gone. 18-year-old kid had to drive home to the armory, tell my commander, I lost the pump, sir. Uh, what do you mean you lost the pump? Like, I, I, I don't know, you know, panicking. And they said, okay, well, you know, you look like crap. Go take a shower, get dry clothes from supply, uh, go to sleep, we'll figure out what to do in the morning. Next morning I wake up, have to fill out like 1,400 forms. Uh, go through a debriefing and they say, all right, we're going to send you back out. Send me back out on my second opportunity for command. They sent me down to the south side of town, down near the golf course, down there, the country club. And I got to guard a Honda generator, about $250, that was in the middle of a cornfield and you couldn't see water in any direction. So uh, you are going to experience failure along the way. <laughs> Don't let that discourage you. If you haven't taken the time to look at some of the pictures and hear some of the stories of uh, folks that were here, I know that, Dan, you were here at that time. Um, I was six flights away from my private pilot check when the flood hit and closed flight ops for almost a month. Um, 
And you know, there's some pretty incredible stories about the university and, and the town in general. Take a, take a moment this week or next week to, uh, to, to read up on them. On a, as an aside, that's probably the only reason why I got a B in my Meteorology 101 or what a 201 course, because there was no final. So this is my career. Um, like I said, I wanted to be the United 777 captain. Graduated from UND in the uh, spring of 2000. Um, commercial aviation major, no minor. Uh, bridge intern with Atlantic Coast Airlines, which was United Express and Delta Connection at the time. Um, went to Washington, D.C. It was a very different picture. I tried three times to get hired by the university as a flight instructor. But there were so many instructors here that you could not get a job. I didn't get picked up. So after college, uh, two days after graduation, I packed all my stuff in my truck, drove back to Washington, D.C., where I grew up. Uh, got a job at Dulles Aviation, uh, which is the area's largest Part 141 flight school. Um, great opportunity. Uh, it allowed me to get outside of the UND bubble and learn a lot about myself as an instructor. To this day, I will say that the best like, stick and rudder pilot that I was was when I was actively instructing full time. I uh, got hired on as a bridge, through the bridge internship program, which at the time was a three month long unpaid internship. And hired at Atlantic Coast Airlines in December of 20, uh, 20, uh, 2000, sorry, um, uh, in the right seat of a CRJ. This was before the Colgan accident, which affected your careers. At the time, there was not a restricted ATP requirement. There was not a 1,000 or 1,250 or 1,500 hour ATP requirement to go to the airlines. I got hired with 660 hours total time and 71 hours of multi-engine into the right seat of the CRJ. And I didn't know what I didn't know. Uh, the airplane ate me up and it was just through the grace of some incredible instructors and check pilots and the cap captain that I was training with was very experienced uh, that got me through training. So um, worked at Atlantic Coast Airlines until 2004. Atlantic Coast became Independence Air. Who has heard of Independence Air in this room? Like two of you. That's why they don't exist anymore. Um, Dan was a, an ACA alum with me. It was a great, uh, great opportunity. Um, we tried to go up against United as the next JetBlue and failed spectacularly. Um, and the company went out of business in 2005. I lost my job, got furloughed. Had, because of 9-11, military deployments, other things that happened, I had never upgraded to captain. I had been awarded captain at ACA, but never had the opportunity to go to the left seat in the five years that I was there. Found myself in 2005 as a 5,000 hour total time furloughed RJFO with zero PIC experience, turbine PIC time. So my options were either to go um, interview with another regional or strike out into the corporate realm. I interviewed with another regional three days after I got furloughed, was not in a great headspace. Um, went out to Shuttle America, which is now Republic Holdings, was one of their companies, and talked to the uh, chief pilot and um, Thought the interview was okay, not great, not bad, but I uh, didn't know, I, I really didn't have my heart in it because of where I was mentally. Three days later, I got a thanks but no thanks letter in the mail that said, Mr. Shields, at this time, nor at any time in the future can Republic Holdings consider you for employment. So it wasn't like thanks but no thanks, but like thanks, it slammed the door shut. Uh, and that was fine, actually, uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, I kept the letter, it hangs in my office as like, the, the, you know, the one thing, the time that I've been rejected. And uh, I jumped into corporate. I made a move to the, uh, a co-captain position, junior guy in a two pilot department, flying a Citation Encore for a company called Carter Machinery. Carter Machinery is the Caterpillar dealer for uh, Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia now. And uh, it was a great job. I was never gonna be rich, but I made more than, a, uh, than I would have as a turboprop captain in year six pay. So I got a pay raise, moved to Roanoke, Virginia, enjoyed it, it was a great job. Flew about 200 hours a year, was home almost every night. Uh, it wasn't very exciting, wasn't very comfortable, but it was a good life for me and my wife. Uh, another economic downturn, 2009, resulted in our flying dropping off and the company said, uh, Josh, you're, we're paying you, you know, good money to not do your job, so you, we're going to assign you on your nine flying days to the purchasing department. You guys have watched Office Space? Anybody? Oh, man, again. Uh, so 
I got to go to purchasing and do cost analysis, and it was like mind-numbingly terrible. Um, I decided then and there, and it was right after the birth of my first daughter, I decided right then and there that I was going to do whatever it took to move on. Our parent company was Caterpillar. They posted a position. I applied for it um, and subsequently was not chosen and lost my job at Carter Machinery because I told them that I had applied for the job. Um, so again, found myself unemployed at the end of 2010 um, because I thought I had done the right thing and let my employer know that I wanted to go to the parent. The parent company found out about that. It had actually been like an HR screw up that the chief pilot never saw my resume. They had posted another job at the end of 2010. I got hired at Caterpillar. Caterpillar, Fortune 50 company, three challengers went there. Uh, awesome, I uh, got to fly around the world. It opened up a lot of doors. In 2016, um, again, there was a sink in the economy. Caterpillar furloughed some people. Um, and uh, they didn't furlough me, but it looked like they were going to have a couple of years of hard growth. So I had the opportunity to move to BAE Systems. And BAE is a uh, US defense manufacturer. It's a, owned by a British company. It's a former company that was British Aerospace. And it moved me back to Washington, D.C., where my wife and I are both from, and we made that move in 2016. It's been the best move in my prof professional career that I've made thus far. Uh, I love my job. I've got great coworkers, and I think I, I you know, I, I have considered on maybe more than one occasion, do I want to go to United on the other side of the field, and I just can't bring myself to even put an application in. So, seven type ratings from the, uh, the CRJ first. I uh, got my ATP afterwards, Citation Encore, Challenger 604, Global Express, Global 6000, and the uh, Falcon Fleet. These are the aircraft that I've flown. I also volunteer on the side as a Civil Air Patrol pilot, uh, pretty extensively, a uh, member of the national staff. But uh, that's my career kind of all in a row. Uh, if any of you have ever heard the Rockaway Beach uh, video of the, the pilot on Long Island flying a former UND airplane that landed on the beach. If you haven't heard it, look that one up on YouTube too because it's a guy that you do not want to be. That airplane is the airplane that I took my private pilot check right in. So the benefits of flying the G550, um, it's a great airplane. It comes with a mirror. They say it's for, uh, to look at the wingtip, but actually it's so that we can primp, you know, Gulfstream pilot, uh, there's big egos involved. Actually, I don't get that. Like, yeah, there's a cult around the Gulfstream. Um, I don't know, I've flown seven types. There's things that impress me about it. There's things that I just look at and go, well, this is way overrated. But um, every airplane has its own personality. Every type has its own personality. Uh, and there's good and bad of each one. This airplane makes my job very easy. It has a two and a half hour seat. I cannot sit in, the, like the cushions are made of concrete or something. I can sit on 172 longer than I can sit in, in the 550. In fact, it's so bad that my boss went out and bought like, you know, the purple mattress cushion. We have those for the cockpit of a $50 million jet. I don't get it. Um, BAE System, so relatively young company. Um, we broke off uh, from, or, or were, were created as the US division of the company formerly known as British Aerospace. Um, we are a U.S. defense manufacturer wholly owned by BAE Systems PLC, a British company. But because we build weapons for the U.S. government, we have our own board and we're entirely independent. We just transfer money north and south, um, which is nice because working for a U.S. company, usually uh, publicly traded, means that you have to deal with shareholders. And in the corporate aviation realm, that can be kind of a bad thing sometimes um, because aircraft can be seen as luxuries and not necessarily essential to business. Uh, we have a little bit of a buffer because our shareholders are, are British. We're traded on the London Exchange. Uh, formed in 2018, they had four, have had four aircraft over the history of their fleet. Uh, first with a Hawker 800, it met an untimely death. I'll show you a picture here in a minute. Uh, they bought a Falcon 2000 after that, added a 900 to their fleet. We replaced the 900 with the G550, and we got rid of the Falcon 2000 uh, just last year. So we're one aircraft department now. 
Uh, at one point, they had nine pilots. We're flying almost 1,000 hours a year with one airplane. The airplane would come home hot swap and go right back out on the road. Uh, it was a crazy time to, to work here right here. Today, we're three pilots, one flight attendant, one mechanic. We also have a scheduler. And the corporate ground transportation uh, drivers fall under the, the purview of my boss, the director of transportation. We are a highly standardized corporate flight department. Uh, you will find across the industry that there is A to Z with regards to what corporate flight departments look like. So my first flight department, we had no written flight operations manual. We had no written standard of beyond what the flight safety Cessna manuals were. Um, we operate our department like an airline. We have a 170 page FOM that looks a lot like what you guys have. Um, Everybody is bought onto it. We do external auditing through the International Standard for Business Aviation uh, Operations. We're stage three, which means that we get audited every three years. Uh, we participate in FOQA, which you guys hopefully are somewhat familiar with. Um, we participate in the ASAP program with the FAA. We have a fully evolved SMS program, um, tactical e emergency response. Um, we do participate in the uh, National Security Program, DASP, which allows us to fly into Ronald Reagan National Airport, DCA, downtown DC. Uh, I really hate doing that because it's a royal pain for us. We have to put an armed officer on board. Um, also have some cool LOAs. The uh, DA in lieu of MDA means that on, uh, we can treat non-precision approaches like precision approaches and actually go through the published MDA. Um, and fly them like ILSs under certain conditions. The coolest one that we have is the EVS, uh, EFVS to touchdown, which allows me to use infrared camera down to zero ver vertical visibility and a thousand RVR, hand flown approaches through the HUD to touchdown. Uh, it's wild. Um, general aviation, corporate aviation generally doesn't do CAT 3 approaches because of the cost and training requirement. Uh, this really doesn't cost us anything else other than the initial training. We're working on uh, RMPAR approach authorization. Uh, we've started the process to figure out what we need to get that. Um, we'll see if we get through it. Right now, both the EFVS and the RMP, uh, you guys have, are aware of the 5G cellular issues that are, are out there. Uh, that's messing all this up. I can't do those at a lot of the airports that we go to because of the 5G interference. Uh, this is the Hawker. Uh, gosh, you guys are kind of young, but in 2008, the Dulles Jet Center at Washington Dulles Airport collapsed in the snowstorm, and that is our aircraft. To date, that is the most expensive insurance accident in history. Over a billion dollars worth of corporate aircraft were written off. Um, there's some great pictures out on, on the internet. Just type in Dulles Airport hangar collapse. Our airplane got cut in half, and then they got the Falcons and uh, subsequently have moved along. So I don't want to talk a lot about money, but I have to talk about money. Because United's here, and Delta's here, and they're going to talk about money. And everybody knows that you know, triple cap 777 captains only work seven days a month and make $500,000. Yes, no, maybe. I mean, I know some airline pilots that make boatloads of cash. I will tell you that. Um, I grew up in Northern Virginia, grew up in Fairfax County. I now live in Loudoun County, which is per capita the most wealthy uh, county in the nation. I will tell you that money doesn't make you happy. It might make you comfortable. So just keep that in mind at the end of the day. Now, you know, when the 777 captain that lives down the street drives by in his $120,000 Tesla, and I'm in my Altima, okay, uh, yeah, uh, but, I have, on numerous occasions, turned down the opportunity to go back to the airlines. And I want to try and tell you guys why. Because my biggest concern as somebody that will probably be a chief pilot uh, when my boss stays away is that the younger generations of pilots are not coming over to this side of the industry. And I don't, one of the problems that we have is corporate aviation is one of the best kept secrets out there because by virtue of why we have corporate aircraft, we don't want to publicize it. You know, we don't want people to know that we have airplanes. We don't want them to know where we go. We don't want them to know the type of flight operations that we have. The best corporate jobs 
that are out there in the industry, you will never hear anything about. You may not even see job postings because they're all word of mouth. Why corporate? Sorry if that's small, but there's benefits to both sides. I won't lie. You know, money for sure at the airlines, but I get variety. Um, Dan's flying for Sun Country. You get to fly to how many different airports? A lot. A lot? Yeah, okay. But you see maybe two dozen regularly. Yeah, and, probably, yeah. And you get to do that on and on and on. And over the course of a 40-year career at an airline, you're going to get to go to the same 50 or 60 airports hundreds of times. Um, to some extent, that's true for me because I go to where my company has facilities, um, which is nice because our headquarters is in London. So I get to spend 20 to 30 nights a year in London, which there's way worse places to be. But I'd also get variety because our job is to carry our executives to where they need to be. That may be San Diego. It may be you know Costa Rica. It may be uh, Kuala Lumpur, or it may be um, places that maybe you don't want to go, like Lawton, Oklahoma. And I knock on Lawton because I was born there. But let me tell you, flying back in a corporate jet 44 years later and staying at the Days Inn is not my idea of a good time. Um, I get time at home. And this is most important about my job. I have two kids. They're 11 and 13. I want to be home with my kids, go to birthday parties. Our executives do not want to be on the road for the weekends. They do not want to work holidays. I get Christmas, New Year's. I can count on two hands the number of holidays that I've worked the last 10 years. Um, I typically work maybe three or four weekends a year right now. Um, so it, it's nice. I'm around for family events. I get to fly the latest and greatest. In my career, I've, I've worked for departments that have taken new aircraft three times. Um, and we will probably be getting a new aircraft sometime in the next two years. So, you know, there's nothing like a brand new shiny jet that smells good and is well kept up. Um, economic cycles and stability? I don't know. Uh, I will tell you that the only thing that is for certain in this industry is that nothing is for certain. Um, I thought I was at a regional airline that, man, it was going gangbusters. They blew through $450 million in like 16 months. Um, I thought I had it made at the Fortune 50 company. Found myself, you know, taking unpaid leave for a couple weeks because of a, a downturn. Um, that said, you know, in a seniority based system, if you work for United Airlines and you're the last person to be hired and then hiring shuts off, you're going to have a terrible quality of life until things change. If you get in at the right time and end up with 700 people below you in one year, then you're golden. You're, you, know, you don't have to worry about your quality of life. For me, my, my company has one airplane. Uh, we're a relatively small department, especially for a defense manufacturer. When you look at Lockheed Martin and Northrop and Boeing, um, Boeing has like nine aircraft and 27 pilots. So we're pretty lean as it is. I, I, I like to think that my job is pretty stable. Um, but if my job goes away, I have two heavy international business jet types, and I can find a lateral move where I'm not going to take a huge amount of pay, uh, a cut. So that's the benefit to corporate aviation is, um, unlike the airlines where when your airline goes away, you go from here to the bottom. Uh, corporate aviation, if my job goes away, I can usually move left or right and keep relatively the same pay and benefit. I have never, in my career, moving from one job to another, I have never taken a pay reduction. I've always made more money as I moved along in my career progression. Um, where the biggest benefit that I see is what an airline pilot may see as a detriment. I'm a people person. I like to talk. I like relationships. Um, corporate aviation is a very much one-on-one -on -one interaction with your passengers. Um, when I was at the airlines, we got on board, we turned left, we closed the door, and off we went. When we got to where we went, we opened the door, we grabbed our bags, we went off, went to the hotel. You turned off your phone, didn't have to worry about work. Very different in the corporate realm. I am the trip captain. That means that everything from the beginning of the trip to the end of the trip is my responsibility. Hotels, catering, uh, transportation for our passengers, logistics, aircraft maintenance that, for anything that happens on the road. Um, flight planning, fueling, servicing the aircraft, loading bags, 
Uh, now I can delegate that downward. The flight attendant takes care of all of her food. Um, you know, maintenance, I can bring in contract maintenance, but at the end of the day, it's all my responsibility. At the airlines, we had dispatchers. They sent us this nice little package. I do 95% of our flight planning. But what that means is that where, you know, one in 10 dispatch releases at an airline or one in 20 might have an issue, um, and then you have to chase down the paper trail to get it fixed and everything else because you have a new dispatcher or something, and you don't have full, co full operational control of your, your realm, I have 100% control of what goes on with my aircraft. And I like that. Um, our department is a family. At an airline, you are a number. I was 15605 at Atlantic Coast Airlines. Um, here, I'm one of three pilots. We treat each other as peers. We have a good time. We joke, I don't know, my flight attendant and I got to know each other. We met at the airlines. She worked for Atlantic Coast Airlines. Um, and we joke that we're like career spouses. We squabble on the road and, you know, get into it. And, and, but we have a good time too. So it's a little bit different. Uh, my family gets together with the other families in the department from time to time. Um, we go out and have team building that the company pays for. Uh, there's a lot of extra benefits around the side. Uh, I think that overall I am treated better as an employee at my current, uh, outside of the airline. I'm not a number. Um, it's a very one-on-one -on -one interaction with my boss, with our passengers. Um, my pay is not predicated on a pay scale or how long I've been there. I negotiate my own rage. Um, and each, each year when performance reviews come up, I can make an argument on why the company should pay me more. With everything that's going on uh, right now, there's, that argument is relatively easy because of what's going on on the airline side of the house. In leaner years, it can be tough. Um, the company offers me other fringe benefits in training. Um, I get to go to seminars. I get to go to conferences, uh, things that they will pay for. Uh, in a typical year, I'll spend four or five days at different seminars, personal de professional development. Um, they paid for me to reinstate my CFI certificate. Um, and if I can ever find a break to get away for nine or 10 days, the company will pay for me to go out to Reno and get my glider add on, like travel, hotel, the cost of training. So those are cool things that you know, the airlines won't do for you. Um, talked about lateral. So diamonds versus coal though, for every great job that you hear in the industry, you're going to hear about two terrible jobs, and that's the reality. And the, you know, to some extent, that's the true in the airline realm, except there's fewer number of operators. So uh, there are bad jobs out there. Uh, there are jobs that you will continually see posted on, online over and over and over because they are, in some way or another, um, broken jobs. So the best thing are the fringe benefits and the food. Um, that's out of order, but um, I'll get to that in just a little bit. This is what the typical year looks like. We're still being hit by COVID. Um, we are now coming out of that, just like you guys are here. But this is 2019. We had four pilots at the time. Um, I am the bottom line here. In 2019, I had 516 hours worth of duty. Um, I flew as the, well, PIC time for us, we log PIC. Um, if you are the assigned PIC, you log PIC, or our system captures all of the legs as PIC time. If you are the assigned SIC to the trip, it captures the, the legs that you are the flying pilot as PIC. That's why those numbers are PIC heavy. Um, the airlines do it a little differently if you are the captain. Um, you log PIC, and if you're the first officer, you log SIC. Everybody in my department is captain qualified, so we, uh, we just designate the captain that's in charge for each trip, and then we alternate legs. Everybody, all the legs are flown from the left seat. So if you're the non-flying pilot, you're in the right seat. You're the flying pilot, you're in the left. Uh, 2019, I had about 250 hours of flying. My, I would say my average is between 250 and 300 a year. Right now with this job, um, I carry about 60 nights a year on the road. 60 to 70, I think the high year I was 75, and that's because I added in some conferences and everything. Um, I can count on two hands the number of holidays that I've worked in the last 10 years, eh, last six years, six and a half years with this company. 
Um, and, you know, 15 of the maybe 110 or 120 days that I have some sort of duty, whether that's travel, flight, sitting in a hotel in a foreign land, um, meetings with my boss or with the department, um, conferences, training, uh, 110 to 120 days a year. The rest of the time are either weekends when I'm not really on call or Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. Uh, I have to have my phone on me with a two-hour call out response time to the airport. Uh, if I get a phone call from work saying, how soon can you be here? It means that somebody has died. Uh, legitimately means that there's an emergency in the company uh, and one of our employees has been killed either overseas and we're going to do notifications or, or deal with crisis management. Short, a short notice trip for my company is less than three days, which is really nice. So we have a very stable schedule. Um, we can look out, know where we're going. The president's or the CEO's calendar is mapped out about nine months in advance. So I can see all the way through December right now, all the international trips will be fine. Looking forward, um, we're coming out of most of the restrictions that COVID has placed on us. Um, you guys are seeing that here. Um, we're seeing it in the, in the industry. Um, the travel, international travel res restrictions have been lifted. There's no testing requirement for most countries. We still have to test our passengers coming home, but that has resulted in our travel picking up. Um, there's still a little bit of a mental, like emotional return to, to normal, um, which is impacting. But overall, our executives, the, the, the C-suite executives that uh, I personally support, they have not changed now that we're back to normal and our facilities open. They're not changing their travel. One of the concerns when all this happened is like, because of remote work, how is that going to impact the need for a corporate jet? Well, the reality is for the people that travel on my corporate jet, they still want eyes on their facilities, their employees, their direct reports, and the ability to go directly to a customer and shake their hand in person, it, it can't be duplicated through a screen. So we expect that we will return to normal or pre-COVID normal. Um, of course, there's some, some challenges out there too. You know, the airlines uh, still have not rebounded fully. Um, the frequency of flights is, is reduced, so that's putting more strain on us because in the instances where our people would have traveled via, via the airlines, they may not be able to because of full flights or not having the schedule. Uh, and then the long-term question is, like, what does the industry look like in two years? Uh, the fuel prices are killing us. Uh, fuel for my department has doubled in the last three weeks. Um, you know, it was a low, at Washington Dulles, the low point was about 320 a gallon um, retail. Um, right now, I believe we're just under $10 a gallon at Dulles for signature flight support. Uh, that obviously represents a huge increase in our operating costs across the board. Um, and it's not just us, it's the airlines, it's everybody else, but that may have an impact. I don't know how that's gonna affect us. The, the war in Ukraine, uh, you have global instability. You know, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. So we'll see. Uh, retirements. Everybody knows the numbers. United and Delta are here this week, too, talking about that. Uh, we, on this side of the industry, we've seen a lot of people leave the corporate realm to go to the airlines, especially those that are under 40. And uh, I get it. I know exactly why they're doing it. Um, but as a result, there's a huge pressure uh, on improving quality of life, improving salaries, improving the operations uh, on the Part 91 and Part 135 and 91K side of the house. One of the things that we don't have, though, is the 91 world does not have a clearly defined career progression. You know, you all know them because they're here selling them. Sign with us today, be an instructor at UND, you go straight to Sky West, you go straight to United, in seven years you'll be a, you know, at United Airlines or five years or however long. Um, there is no such thing for the corporate realm, uh, at least not right now. We'll see what happens as things get tighter and tighter. But uh, however you cut it, it's good for all of you. So this is some shots that I've taken. Um, this is the HUD that we have in our aircraft. Uh, and this is actually the HUD from the Global that I flew, but it has synthetic vision uh, from like the G1000, except we have it in the HUD, which is pretty cool. This is what the infrared camera looks like on our aircraft. Uh, that's a marketing shot, I think, taken by Col Collins Aerospace. 
Um, but that's what a runway will look like in fog, zero, zero visibility. Um, and through that te technology in the HUD, uh, I can land in that, that, those conditions down to 1,000 RVR. Uh, patience is key in your careers. This is, uh, I don't know, circa 2004, my coworker caught me sleeping. We were in Bluefield, West Virginia. There's nothing in Bluefield. It's like you step back into the 1930s, but uh, there was nothing to do but lay out on the wing and get some sunshine. So I, I, the one thing that I have definitively going for me is what I get to eat. Doesn't this look appealing? Who wants to dive into that crew meal? Uh, this is sent to me by a buddy at UPS. This is what he was eating on his Hong Kong trip uh, a couple weeks ago. Looks delicious. That's his crew meal. Here's my crew meal. So all of these meals were served on board my flight at one point or another in my career. I think I win that battle. Um, even better than that, when the flight attendant really likes me, she brings along ice cream and pie and other things. That's why, like, I needed to buy an exercise bike and get a gym membership because, yeah, uh, she keeps throwing stuff at this, like this at me. Travel is glamorous. Airline, corporate, uh, you know, I want you guys to get a, a good picture of what you can look forward to when you reach the highlight of your career. So I put some pictures of where I've been. Many of these places I've really enjoyed. Some of them I have absolutely no desire to go back to. Um, I have been to places where, particularly in Central South America, Mexico, where we were under armed escort all the time. Armored cars, um, like situations where our escort said, do not come to the door, do not open the door unless you see me outside. But the reality is, before I knock, you're going to get a text message from me that I'm knocking on your door. So if somebody knocks and you haven't gotten the contact from me, don't open the door. Um, one of our trips, we had some of our passengers in Mexico um, get attacked by a cartel. Their, their SUV was shot up by a bunch of automatic weapons. So, you know, I don't necessarily need to go back to those places. Some of them are really great, though. Um, but, you know, uh, great hotels. Uh, you know, including sleeping on the airplane before in a snowstorm. So these are pictures from my hotel room. Um, I've had some really incredibly scenic views before, um, including the one that I'm in right now. That's the Canad Inn. I took that this morning. So, you know, uh, love waking up to a beautiful view. But actually, you know, I have been able to travel to some pretty incredible places. Um, the, the, the flip side to corporate is... Um, because we're considered safety critical, we often can get exemptions from like corporate travel policy. So from time to time, I've stayed in nicer hotels than my passengers have. Uh, we go to London and we stay right downtown London. The hotels are like 700 pounds a night. It, it, it's a, insane, like $900 a night. Uh, and we get to keep the points. Most airline guys don't. I rack up about 700,000 Marriott points a year. Some cool destinations, things that I get to do, uh, zip lining through the Costa Rican rainforest, surfing in Hawaii, um, you know, tours of old castles and, and underground catacombs in Italy and, and Europe. Um, I've, I've been to the Great Wall in Beijing. Um, Beijing, I could probably add to that list of places I don't need to go back to. Um, we were over there, and uh, it's very smoggy because they don't have pollution controls. And my boss joked to me, he said, you know why everybody smokes in, in Beijing? It's because it's the only way to get filtered air. And to, to, some, ex <laughs> to some extent, it's true. You walk out, and your eyes burn from, from the smog in the air. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, this was a nice day at the Great Wall. You can actually see like a couple hundred. It was about a quarter mile that you could see up the Great Wall. Uh, just some more places I've been. Moscow is actually a pretty cool city. Um, who knows how long it'll be before anybody can get back to Moscow. But um, the Russian citizens are, are they're very stoic, but I found them to be very helpful. Like if you stood around looking like you were a stupid American, didn't know what you were doing, um, they would stop and engage you. And, and I think that what's going on over there right now is just really unfortunate. Um, hopefully we can figure out a way to 
to de-escalate the situation and, and, and go back. Unfortunately, working as a US defense manufacturer, um, you know, Russia and China and uh, Iran, uh, probably not places that I'm going to have, have the opportunity to go to, which, like I said, OK, that, uh, I'm OK with that. So um, we have, I don't know, 15 minutes left? I don't know what time I'm done. But I want to give you my view from the top. And then I'll take some questions from you. So things have changed since even last year I was a SAMA conference speaker. Um, and things have changed in the last year for you. And they've changed in a good way. So this is my soapbox moment and my, my view from 47,000 feet. Uh, that was a picture I took in December over Greenland. Um, the great thing about corporate flying is our airplanes can fly faster and higher than most airliners. So, um, you know, on those summer days in July when we're flying coast to coast across the country at, seven, uh, at 45,000 feet and sipping our coffee and listening to Sun Country 214, we need 40 degrees to the right for weather and it's moderate chop. Uh, I look down and go, hi, Dan. <laughs> So with the caveat that I am an outsider looking into the airline industry, I have not been an airline pilot since 2005, so I am not an expert on what's going on on that side of the field. I will tell you that you guys have an incredible opportunity that has not been this way for decades. And you're very fortunate in the timing of your career. This career very much is luck. It's the right place, right time, who you know, and just the circumstances that unfold. You know. Go back and talk to an Eastern Airline pilot or somebody that worked for TWA or Pan Am and ask them if they were, you know, these huge legacy airlines that all of a sudden ceased to exist. Um, but that doesn't come without perils and pitfalls. Um, what I'm seeing is a change in attitude, um, both from within the industry and from people coming up. I flight instruct on the side, so I deal with day-to-day, uh, -day, well, almost day-to-day -day interactions with young CFIs like yourself. You are entitled to nothing. And I, I'm an old guy, and I'm saying that. And I want you all to realize this. I go on Facebook. There's all sorts of groups out there, aviation career mentoring, co corporate pilot wannabes, airline pilot wannabes, whatever. And you're seeing a lot of people that are posting, I'm a 1,500-hour CFI. and you know, Frontier has just reduced their minimums to 1,000 hours or whatever. Um, be really careful. Um, you know, what you don't want to do is get ahead of yourself. Everything is an interview. And I mean that so importantly. Everything that you do in life is an interview for your next step in your career. Social media is the downfall of so many candidates. And I know that I'm not the only one that is here this week saying that. Watch your footprint. Watch what you're doing. Be responsible about your actions. Because the decisions that you make here that may just be stupid college student things, and I was a stupid college student, and there are two people in this room at least sitting here that can probably say or that they may have been witness to my stupid college stuff. The difference is when in 2000 or the late 90s when we were students, people didn't carry cameras with them all the time. So you are entitled to nothing. Just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can apply and get hired at Allegiant or Sun Country or United doesn't mean that you should. Make sure that you are ready to make that next step. Delta Airlines just had, actually, we talked this morning at the Alumni Advisory Board. Delta Airlines just had last year a, like, eight or nine month longevity first officer bid and be awarded captain on the 717 in Newark or JFK or some airport that I know I don't want to be based at. Um, you know, the reality is in this industry, that person that was just awarded captain could have become a captain with less than two years flying a jet. Maybe they came up flying a thousand hours in a Cessna Caravan, and then they went to the right seat of a RJ and for two months, and then they got hired uh, you know, at an Acme cargo company, 
flying seven threes and seven fives for two months, and now they're at Delta. And uh, you know, the reality is, I don't know what the experience of that person was, but if they put themselves ahead of where they are, emotionally, technologically, technically, skill-wise, whatever, um, maturity-wise, um, they can set themselves up for huge failure. On the side, I manage, or I, my wife and I co-own a corporate consulting, uh, career consulting resume business. In the last six months, I have counseled seven people that somewhere along their way, they have washed out of training at a 121 uh, training uh, curriculum and either resigned or were terminated and now they cannot get calls. So now they're coming to me for advice on how can I get a job in the 135 or the part 91 industry because that one training event that they washed out of has closed all the doors in their career and it will take them a decade to get back to where they were. So don't think that just because you can, you should. You, you, it, it will cost you more in the long term. Don't succumb to the fear of missing out. We talk a lot about seniority, and seniority is important. But I've seen a lot of people just like get that tunnel vision, and the only thing that's important to them is what is the next step? What do I need to pass my next stage check, my next check ride, to get hired, to get an interview, to. And instead of all they're looking is down that, that straw and they're missing opportunities, they're missing personal growth and development. Um, so you're not gonna miss out. Let me tell you, as long as things keep going, you guys have it made. It, the industry has never looked like this before. And even if there is a slowing down or something, a hiccup along the way, it will rebound. People have to travel. It takes a long time to train a pilot. So you have that going for you. Build bridges and maintain them. One of the things that I think you all miss out on is speakers like myself come into school. We hand out our business cards. We put up our contact information. I've been here dozens of times since I graduated. Every time I hand out business cards, I've done mock interviews, I've done capstone projects. Out of 150 or 200 students that I've interacted with, on more than just this type of level, one of them has kept in touch with me. What you don't realize is that the alumni that come back, we can open doors for you. So when we tell you, here's our email, here's our phone number, our LinkedIn, whatever, take advantage of that. Because we wouldn't be here talking to you if we didn't want to help you out along the way. Um, so I realized that I'm an old guy, but if nothing else, every six months, shoot me a text or an email and say, hey, this is where I'm at, what do you think? What can I do to make myself, what can I do to, to whatever? Uh, I wanna go to this company, do you know anybody there? Because we can put you in touch with people that might make the difference in your career. Make those opportunities for yourself. Don't sit there and wait for them to come to you don't be overbearing. Uh, you know, if you start calling me every week, I'm going to block you. But, uh, you know, I'm not your best friend. I'm not your, 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 your emotional counselor. But make opportunities. Go out and seek them. Um, I have been told that the opportunity that I made available to students and the, the, the feedback that I got was great for this environment. I, my company is starting an internship this year. It's a three-week internship paid. It's worth about $15,000. I'm taking a student to London in the jump seat of my airplane on a trip. We're trying to get sim time. We had three students from UND apply. So, you know, open your eyes. Find opportunities around the margin. Finally, be open to change and redirects. Uh, like I said, I wanted to be that 777 captain. Maybe sometimes when I wake up in the morning, I still do, but um, my career has gone like this. So don't get so focused on that end goal that you have right now that you miss those opportunities that might pop up. Don't be so closed-minded about what you want to do right now that you're not open to maybe saying, well, how about this? How would this affect me differently? Um, the, the world is full of opportunity. And what's most important is that, you know, as you go along, you find people that can help pull you up. And then when you get to that point where you can 
help others, do that. I'll leave you with this. And uh, pilots don't do public math. I'm really bad at math. But uh, uh, write this down. And actually, this I did the underline wrong. So take the underline off of this side of the equation. But when you're talking about aviation, and for, who in here is a flight instructor? Wow, just like a couple of you. So you're teaching now, but the rest of you are students. When you get frustrated with your flight instructor because they're like, hey, I think we need to do something else, keep this in mind and keep it in mind for your flight instructors. This is what this formula is. It's taken from a Caterpillar vice president that I used to fly around, very smart lady. Trust is equivalent to competency multiplied against familiarity divided by risk. Which means that for me to put trust in your ability or whatever, I need to know two things, or I need to know how good you are at that thing. So how good you are, if I don't know it, does me no good. If I know you really well, but I don't know how good you are at it, also doesn't do me any well. But then you have to divide that by risk. If the job is to take this pencil over to Kent Lovelace's office, that's pretty low risk to me. But if the job is to put you in the left seat of my G550 and carry my primary passengers are around and I'm sitting there interviewing you, your goal is to make, you a, make me as familiar with your competency as you can in that short period of time. And this applies to any stage of your career along the way. You want to make yourself as familiar to whoever, whoever is in charge of your abilities so that they can see that together to overcome the risk that they're putting in you. Here's my information. Um, your instructors have it. Like I said, you're always welcome to reach out to me. Email is probably preferred. Um, and it might take a little bit of time for me to get back to you. But if you don't hear from me in a week or so, ping me again. If it doesn't bother me, um, ask me your questions, send me your stuff. Um, and I, like I said, I'm happy to help you all out however I can. Do we have a couple minutes for questions? Well, two questions. Three sure. Questions. What I, however long we have, I'm, I'm happy to. Do you think like the future of like this corporate business travel is like, do you think there's a area for it with like tilt rotors and stuff like that in the future? So the whole tilt rotor, quadcopter, you know, unmanned like Uber transports and stuff. Uh, do I think that that's going to come to fruition? Yeah, I do because uh, the people that fly business jets, especially the, the, the high net worth individuals, if it will get them there faster, they don't care. You know, if you're a Bill Gates, you care zero about the cost. Right. Um, so um, I think that it will come at some point, but the timeline is, is yet to be determined. Uh, the reality is, you know, your ability to go out here and catch an Uber to Fargo via quad quadcopter is probably a long way away um, because of the, the, just the way that the FAA is, if nothing else. The FAA, is not a trend-setting organization. Um, and it's incredibly frustrating for, for, I know the university, it's frustra frustrating for us in the business um, sometimes. So I think it's coming. It's just kind of along with that same question is how, how long before we have single pilot airliners or autonomous aircraft? It will happen at some day. But uh, to be honest, I don't think you guys are going to have too much of an issue with it. You're going to see single pilot airliners, I think, before you see people flying around in two seat quadcopters. Right. But the AW609 can hold like eight people, and that's been around for kind of a while, too. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the same time, the infrastructure isn't there. I mean, look at New York and the number of helicopters that there are. And, and in terms of the total population that it's serving, it's a very small segment. Because the reality is you have the NIMBYs, the not in my backyard. They don't want you, you know, when Amazon starts delivering drones packages, the last thing that people are going to want is, you know, an eight foot wide drone flying over their house at 300 feet, making noise to drop off your whatever you just ordered off of Amazon. Right. 
I could be wrong, though. I... Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's the better GPA or a pilot can have before they apply or they get an interview in, in your company? So I will tell you this, GPA and a university degree from any university, UND or Embry-Riddle or Purdue or Western Michigan or anywhere, is important for your first job. After you get your first job, that's about it, as long as you do well in that first job. Um, at the end of the day, we all have the same certificate. What UND is getting you is a network of people that uh, you can reach out to. You're getting reputation that adds to your resume. And you're getting uh, the opportunity of having bridge programs and, and people that are coming back to, to establish a relationship. After you get your first job, it really doesn't matter. We all have the same, the an identical FAA certificate. It looks the same whether you learn to fly here or at Joe Bob's Flight School in you know Razorback, Arkansas, or at Embry Riddle. So, GPA is important, yes. But to be honest, when you get to my, uh, here's the the sad reality is I can't hire any of you. Um, there's no way that my company would allow me to take. Uh, a graduate or even somebody that is, let's say, stays here for a couple of years and is 2,000 or 3,000 hours of instruction time as, and is a course manager. Um, there's no way that we're going to hire somebody with no turbine experience into the left seat of a, of a 550, not even the right seat. So the career progression to get to my job would be to go somewhere, either a 135 operator or a regional, and then look to look, come back to the, to the 91 realm. The problem with that for me is you guys go off to a regional, SkyWest, Republic, wherever, and you realize, hey, the airlines aren't that bad, and now I've lost you forever. So I'm here to tell you, yes, go to the regionals. I learned a lot of lessons at the regional airlines. I learned how to deal with a-hole captains. I learned how to deal with weather. I learned how to deal with broken aircraft and everything that can happen, passengers that are screaming in the aisle, and, and de-icing, and all sorts of stuff that fortunately I don't have to deal with anymore. And it made me a better pilot. It made me better equipped to do this. But I know that by telling you that, 99% of you are going to look on at that United 777 job. And my hope is that you know, if I keep coming up here every couple of years or whatever, talking in classes, that maybe, maybe three or four percent of you will go, hey, remember that funny Asian guy that, you know, uh, told the story about the pump? Uh, maybe I'll reach out to them and see what's going on on the corporate side of things. Because hopefully we can get a couple of you back. But I know, I, you know, I can't take you out to pizza every four weeks. Or, you know, the SkyWest is up here, United is up here. They're all beating you with a hammer. And that's great, but I hope that you'll remember this. Well, I hope that the internship this year goes well and that you know next year more than three people will apply. Um, that's the goal. So, But thank you for your time. I will be at tonight's reception. Uh, I know that the next session is getting ready to go, so I'll shut up now. And then uh, if you've got questions, I'll be outside. Thank you.